introduce our guest presenter today. His name is Patrick Roach. He is an alum, an HR alum from our University of Lethbridge, as well as a proud co-op employer and uh, an active professional in the HR field. So I'll let him introduce himself in his session, and thank you all for coming. Well, thanks so much for coming, guys. I, I know that I'm secondary to the food. I, I totally get that. Um, I'm 40, and that still drives is my driving force food. So thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. So I had the opportunity to come here a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, and I did a presentation on branding, talking about how you are a marketable brand. And so this really kind of builds off of that. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to explore that, I think the co-op still has options for you to view that information. And so today as we go through, if you have questions as we go through, I have a, a slide at the very end for questions, but as we go through, if you do have um, a question that's relevant to the topic at hand, please feel free to engage in an open conversation. Or if you feel that maybe I've missed something and you have something you want to input to the group so that we can learn as a whole, totally okay as well. Um, so we'll get started. And <clears throat> just so you were aware, I am with Green Acres Foundation in Lethbridge, and I do have some business cards here if afterwards you hope to explore your professional networking, I'm on LinkedIn, you can certainly feel free to add. All right, well, we're going to see if this works. Ah, so <clears throat> the whole talk is about office etiquette and communication. Um, this is really about um, having a conversation with you, the students, preparing you to enter the professional realm. Um, changing from what you do in an educational setting to a work environment. Um, and there are some fundamental differences between the two. And so I'm hoping, I only have a, so much time today to cover a lot of the topics, so I may go through them fairly quickly in some areas. But at the end, if you do have additional questions, I'll be around here 15, 20 minutes, and you can certainly come ask me additional questions. Perfect. Thank you. So we're talking about assessing and adapting to office culture. And so day one of your co-op, because I think most people here are either in co-op or about to go into co-op. Um, so this is really about identifying what you need to learn day one, day two, week one, week two, moving forward in your professional careers. And so one of the things you want to first identify is what are the dynamics of the office environment that you're in. So that's really speaking to how does the organization function? How does the flow of information go? Um, the reporting structure, do you, you probably will get identified to this is your supervisor, but is that the only supervisor you have? Are there other powers at play in the organization that you may want to defer to? And having an understanding of how those office dynamics interact and evolve is going to be really important for you both being successful in co-op and navigating the professional realm of your own individual careers. And communication and time. So there's an expectation that a lot of organizations have that, you know, clock starts at this time, ends at this time. However, if you arrive, if you're supposed to work from 9 to 5, let's say, and you arrive at 9, are you late or not late? What is the expectation for the employer about what they consider to be time? Um, do they consider you to be there 15 minutes early prior to the start of your shift so you're ready to work at 9, which would be what my go-to position would be? Um, but understanding the nature and the culture of the environment that you're taking your call in is going to be really important uh, day one. Does that make sense for everyone? Lots of head nodding. Um, and so understanding how communication works there as well and understanding who can you talk to and when can you talk to them about challenges you have in your co-op, um, about your peers or colleagues, um, and in regards to perhaps your, your educational responsibilities as well while you're managing the co-op. Um, and so as we move into the identifying influences, I'm sure everybody here has worked in some sort of group setting and a group project in university. Kind of, yes. Yeah. And so then you've got uh, 
you'll either be assigned a group or they'll be like, can everyone just get four or five people together and form this group? And then you've got someone like, I'll be the leader, or you get the people that I'll be the supporter, um, different roles within the group. However, when you move into the employer's realm, a lot of those optional decisions aren't necessarily always present for you. Um, they might assign you, you're going to be the supporter. You're going to be the record keeper. Um, and the dynamic of a group function is very different in an employer setting versus an educational setting. And so it's really important to, to understand that difference. Um, it's also, in, a, in an educational setting, when you do a group, you, oftentimes when I ask a question, so tell me about a time where you worked in a group setting, and, and always the example is social loafer, right? And almost every group in university seems to have a social loafer that they have to deal with and respond to. But what do you do in the office environment? Um, and is there that capacity for social loafer? Yes, and, and but how do you deal with that? And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, and understanding the communication dynamics of the work environment. So my current office uh, has an open floor setting. It's, it's kind of got cubicle base, and it's really sound travels really easy throughout it. And so people talking really loud become really annoying to the people next to them. Same thing with music and different things, it can encroach. And so you need to be aware of that aspect of your environment as well. So there's you, and then there's everybody else around you. And you have to understand the nature of the organization and how you're going to fit into it. Because what you're trying to do is impress upon the employer that your personal brand is something that they took a chance on, they want to keep you, and that you want to propel yourself forward in your career off this launching pad. Does that make sense? So with the interpersonal communications, it's really important. Uh, my background is in HR. Love it. Love everything about it. Um, and oftentimes, I always have to try to envision what another person is thinking, feeling, um, what they're perceiving the world to be. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting thing about uh, truth. Truth is fiction. There's no such thing as truth. It's absolutely made up. Um, truth is just series, simply a series of facts. And facts are dependent upon your experience, your lifestyle, your perspective at the time. Um, for example, if you observe a car accident and the police officer is going around questioning everyone, depending on where your position is, the truth of what happened can change based on your perspective. And so really understanding how others might perceive you is step one. About thinking about what your brand is, what are you portraying, and how are others going to view you. And understand the relationship dynamics within an organization. Um, understand that in my office we have our CEO, which is directly in our office building. This is the first work environment that I've ever had that my CEO is in the same office building, and I have direct access to it. In other organizations, I've had to kind of go through a gatekeeper uh, to access the CEO. So understanding those dynamics about just because they may be in the building, can I directly go ask them questions? So just understanding how the, the nature of the organization is structured, how it's set up, and how that communication flows, and how that relationship dynamic within that organization works is going to be really important for you to navigate. I hope I'm not scaring anybody away or anything like that. Um, and again, if you have any questions as we go through, please feel free to comment. So topics to avoid, um, interpersonal communications. I'm sure you're pretty familiar with some things you should avoid. Um, anything that's really polarizing, sex, drugs, politics, religion, um, those are all very hot button topics where people are very passionate about their opinions. And if you ask them for it, they'll give them to you. Um, but they can also put you in hot water if you engage in it, depending on your perspective, the organization's perspective, your coworkers' perspective, your supervisor's perspective. See how it all kind of ripples and travels out. So on email communications, which is interesting, my last organization I was a part of, I did HR for a large financial uh, firm. 
and we had operations in Ireland and in the U.S. and in Canada. So I was based at a Lethbridge, but I also dealt in the U.S. and in Ireland. So what's an interesting is when you're sending out email communications or any kind of documentation, um, you're ensuring that the language that you're using is appropriate to where you're sending it to. So in my organization, often defaults um, in your Microsoft Office are the U.S. settings. Um, so words like honor, humor, uh, favorite, uh, all have two various different spellings for Canada versus U.S. And if you send something to the U.S. internationally or in Canada, you're writing a documentation or sending something out, ensure that you're spelling it based on where you're, where you're sending it to, where your audience is from, because they're also going to recognize that. They might be like, huh, don't they know how to spell that word? Um, so it's just important that there, there are small little things, but it's important for you to be aware because it influences how people are perceiving you. Um, the subject line in an email is often really important in an organization. Um, but the email is generally false threads. I'm sure that you sent lots of emails, uh, both in university and personally, um, or more text. And so generally, an email is a fellow of thread. Um, it's a lot easier for me because I get about between 60 and 100 emails a day that I have to navigate and go through. So I have to be able to quickly navigate through emails to find the content that I need to be able to action it forward. So when you're creating your email, it's really important to indicate in the subject line what it is. For example, if I was doing a disciplinary documentation, um, I might put um, discipline employee or discipline so location employee, something that's quickly and easily identifiable and something that's used throughout my organization so that way if someone else needs to refer or find the information, they can find it quickly. Um, it's also important to note that on a forwarding or a connection or reply thread, if you go in and change the subject line, that creates a new thread. So it makes it very difficult um, for someone who's trying to follow a line of information if you change the subject line partway through a conversation. So that's just something small, but it's something important to note. And of course, content and tone um, share a story. So in one of the previous organizations that I worked, I sent an email communication out um, to a, a manager asking them to deal with something that was confidential in nature. And I, and I included on the tagline, you know, this, this is sensitive information that needs to remain confidential and secured at all times. So this particular manager took offense to what I had sent. Even though that was in the confines of my role, they took offense and they brought in their manager, the site director, um, the director above him, and myself into a meeting to have a conversation about um, what they perceived my email said about them. They, they inferred that due to the content that I had sent, that I thought they were untrustworthy, but they had to be reminded that this had to be confidential, where that should have been second nature already. Um, fast forward during that meeting, I, I didn't apologize. I apologized to the fact that they took offense, but that my position at that time was secure and I was following protocol for the company. So it's really important to understand what the company protocols are and to ensure that prior to hitting send, does the content of your message and it be construed to say something else? You know, I had the best intent of when I sent my, my document out, but it clearly didn't have the same reception that I anticipated. That. So that's always something to to know just in the back of your mind prior to hitting send, how might my receiver interpret the information I'm communicating? Because on, on emails, you've heard this lots of times, there's no, there's no such thing as tone. Sarcasm sucks in email because you just can't tell. Um, also important to note that anything that's written down in an email form could eventually land up in litigation in court um, from an employer's perspective. Any emails that's sent. Um, so offhanded comments, remarks that you might think are frivolous in the moment to a coworker um, can end up in litigation. 
So also think about that prior to sending emails back and forth to the company is, is this something that you would not be embarrassed of that would show up in court? Because that's a reality. Any questions? Okay. So we're moving into the professional boundaries area, um, leaving things at the door. I've had, I've had a lot of college students. I've been a college student. I've had a lot of college students. Um, and one of the challenges are uh, social activities at night, which are really fun. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, hanging out with friends, having a good time, going to a party is awesome. And I thoroughly think that you should have a good work-life balance. However, that balance shouldn't affect me as the employer. Um, so it's really important to note that those Awesome fun things that you may or may not do outside the office should stay outside the office. It shouldn't interfere with your ability to function and do the work that we, as the employer, are paying you to do. Um, understanding your organization's mission, vision, and values is also really critical. Um, I recommend everyone, if you haven't already gotten your co-op, which I hope everyone has, but um, when you're applying for a co-op, think about who you're applying with. Um, do their mission, vision, and values align with your own personal needs? Um, because they should match. My current organization, their values are integrity, respect, honesty, and loyalty. Those are all things that I think are critically important in an organization. And I love the fact that the organization I work for embodies those beliefs. So it's really important I encourage you to really Find an organization, a company that aligns with your personal values because that authenticity that you bring is critically important and it's one thing that we always look for. And the other thing that's important about understanding this when it comes to communication and etiquette is do your actions with the employer align with the company's mission, vision, and values? Because everything that you do should be to further the mission, vision, and values of an organization. You, your brand, is propelling forward the brand of the organization. Um, so it's really important. And, and the organization spends a lot of money on branding uh, to ensure that the brand stays solid. And if you work for a company and are posting on social media uh, something contrary to the company's values, belief system, mission statement, you're done. Because um, the company will always put its bottom line ahead of you. That's a reality. Important to understand safe communication. Um, some of you may have had the experience. I worked in retail uh, when I was younger. And uh, sometimes I would experience managers that would take me out to the floor being like, Pat, I told you, you got to do this better. It's not appropriate. It's not really a safe place in the middle of the floor where there's customers coming in and out. So in an office setting, or any setting really, you have to understand what safe communication. Um, that you can communicate freely with people, but understand where you're communicating and what the content of that communication is. Because that's critically important, um, both in that branding of you, that respect of others, and that respect of self. Um, because all of you have the right to a safe workplace that's respectful, period. Um, humor. So I generally have a very dark sense of humor. My wife not, doesn't particularly appreciate it. Um, and I don't often uh, share my dark sense of humor with my coworkers at work uh, because of the fact that it might cause offense. Um, I think I'm funny, but uh, they might not. So it's important to understand uh, for oneself is the humor that I'm bringing, the jokes that I'm saying, can it be construed differently? Um, how will the receiver interpret it? Um, am I in an area where something might be overheard? Any questions so far? So as you can see, uh, dealing with difficult situations, the elephant in the room. I have a scenario. I'm going to see how this works. I don't know if it's going to work or not. But I have a scenario 
And I actually would love to get some input from your perspectives of how you would deal with this scenario. So a fellow worker, Alice, has been reporting to the boss the progress of your group in such a way that it appears that she is the central force and the idea person in the group. This is not true since her contributions have been about equal to everyone else. The other, people, the other group members don't know she's been advancing her position in the organization at the expense of others, and maybe even making others look unproductive. You know what Alice is doing. Alice is slightly above you in rank. You like her and you work well with her. You feel, however, that, that her easy and regular access to her manager and inaccurate reporting of the group's progress will ultimately undermine others in the group. So you're new. This is your first co-op in this work environment. What do you do? Suggestions and comments? Yeah? Alice might not realize that she can uh, improve exposure directly to bring up your concerns and respect your matter. Um, and maybe she might realize that there are things that she could change, the whole group could change. So, you know, work together. Sometimes people don't even think about the kind of things that they think about. Absolutely. And was there a comment back here as well? No? <laughs> um, spot on. Like, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, you identified respectful. Um, because one thing we, we don't know is we probably all experienced those times where we've said something or done something and someone has taken offense. We didn't mean to cause any offense, um, but that was the perception, and we've had to correct it. So in the same situation with Alice, having that conversation with her absolutely is the first step. You know, safe environment, taking a side, and speaking to the nature of the problem. Alice, I noticed that this happened the other day. I was wondering, could you, I don't want to make any assumptions, but could you explain to me a little bit more about that? Right? Because then that opens an opportunity for dialogue between both of you. And then, of course, if, if it doesn't change, and if, in fact, Alice is stealing your work, then you go to that next level which might be the supervisor, the manager in the situation, um, and which may or may not get traction because you're new to the organization, right? But you also have an awesome resource with the co-op office. That's another connection point that you have. If you, if, you, if you run into situations that you don't necessarily know how to navigate on your own, they're a great resource for you to draw upon. Um, any questions, comments about that? Um, and it's very difficult sometimes when you think about um, Patrick elephant in the room. Patrick, well, one of the things that came from the Calgary when we were talking about it was to document. Yep. Keep track of what's going on. Yep. Um, and so there's there's a balance you want to you want to have in an organization because you don't want the perception to be that you're the person that documents everything. Right? right? It's a balance in all, all things. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, when you go to your manager, or the supervisor in this instance, um, you want to be able to say, hey, I spoke with Alice. I tried to resolve it. This, this was when I spoke to her. Um, I let it go. I, maybe I spoke to her again. And I, and I didn't see a different result. I need your help. Right. And you've got me some suggestions. And, and often, 
I love it when students come to me and, and that they don't want me to give them the answer, but they want me to tell them where they can find the answer or give them guidance about how they could navigate the situation or problem for themselves. And I love that when students come, and so come to me and ask me for those types of questions. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, but it's really important that there are going to be elephants in the room. There are going to be challenges with your co-op. Um, there are going to be areas that um, you've looked at the job description, you've done your interview, you've gotten it, you're like, yes, I've got this in the bag. Um, day one, week one, week four, month four, it's changed. Something is different and it doesn't jive. That's life. Um, how are you going to deal with it? How are you going to navigate that change? How are you going to deal with that elephant in the room? And so having those strategies or those concepts in your mind now prepares you for when you get into those moments. Even if it's just reaching out to the amazing co-op office here and saying, I have a question. I have a concern. This is different. Can you help? And they will. They did for me. Uh, and I don't think the university has changed um, all that much <laughs> since I've been here. So we go into uh, co-op work term advice. So speaking both um, as a student having gone here and as a co-op student who has gone through this program here, and now from the employer's perspective, I have I have kind of a, a broad range of perspective on, on these, these areas. Um, you know that, that term, you know, like, oh, there's no bad questions. Yes, there are. Some of your questions can be stupid. Um, so think about the questions you have and ask good relative questions. I always have an open door policy for any student that comes to me. Um, and I always try to do, um, give them guidance and direction. But I want them to at least have had some logical thought prior to asking me the question. I want them to come to me with, Pat, I've, this is my problem. This is a challenge. This is, these are the options I've tried. What do you suggest? Because that shows initiative on your part, which I love as an employer. Um, and it shows that you're, you're committed, you're dedicated, and you're willing to give up more than 100% to whatever it is you're working on. And I love that. Take me into initiative. Uh, so then uh, jot down notes during training. This is one of my particular pet peeves um, in organizations that I've worked in. When, and it's not just students, but new hires. Uh, I offer them a book, and they're like, now nah, I got this. Really? You got this. I've been working in this organization for two, five, ten years, but you don't need to take notes on what I'm trying to teach you. Okay. Um, so what is that perception saying? What are you communicating to me as the employer? That you're smarter than what I'm trying to teach you? That perhaps you don't need to know because you got this. So again, it's that perception, that branding of you, because this is a stepping stone into your career. What is that saying about you? Get involved with events within the organization. So I currently have a co-op student in my office, and I asked him this question. I said, so why do you think it's important to be involved in activities and events? And they were like, wow, well, probably engagement, right? Well, that's what you get out of it. But what do I, as the employer, see? I see someone that is here for more than nine to five, someone who's fully engaged with the organization, someone that uh, aligns with um, my strategic vision for the organization, and I see that you want to be a part of it. Um, and if I have a, two students, one that's showing initiative with events within the organization, and I have a job opportunity, that student's going to get it. Period. Because that's the behavior, that occupational citizenship type behavior, that's what I want as an employer. Now, they're fun, they're engaging, and there's a lot of fun things that the employee gets out of it, but I want you to be aware of what the employer is looking for and what the employer identifies. Um, 
the work term learning plan. Some of you may have done this, some of you may not. Um, as you go into your co-ops, um, you do a work term learning plan. So it's a living document. Uh, a living document means it's just, don't just write it, set it aside, and be done with it. So that's dead. A living document is something that you, you update, you engage throughout the entirety of your co-op terms, term or terms. Because um, if I'm a good employer, which I, I like to think that I am, um, your objectives and goals are going to change as you mature in your co-op and as you start propelling yourself forward in your career. And as, you're, as those maturity happens in your organization, your goals, ideas, directions, and achievements on your work term learning plan are going to change, and they need to change. So you need, to, not, you need to change it there, and you need to communicate it to your supervisor and be like, you know what, when I first started this co-op, uh, these were my goals. I have nailed every single one of them. So I've made some new goals, and I want to talk it over with you to make sure that I can achieve them. Because if I am a good supervisor of a co-op student, I'm going to look for lots of opportunities to allow you the opportunity to achieve those results. Any questions? Okay. Uh, maintain a learning attitude. Um, on that perception, I've had co-op students that have, they haven't shown initiative. Um, when I approach them, I get the, the crossed arms. For those who, who can't see me, I'm crossing my arms. Um, but I'm, I'm indicating that I'm closed off. Um, if I offer opportunities, um, either engagement, um, connect to, connections, networking opportunities, take them. Always show that you are willing and able to go above and beyond their expectations because they're evaluating you all the time. And the more opportunities that you have to showcase your skill set, to showcase that brand that you have, the more likely you are to land a permanent job with that organization or to get a great reference and propel you forward uh, on your career. And last one, learn from disappointment. As I mentioned earlier, stuff happens. It's going to happen. Um, you probably have had it in classes where you think you've got everything right, and then all of a sudden, bam, and you're like, what happened? And then you have to adapt and change. Um, how you adapt and change in the moment is going to be really reflective both of you as a professional and really an eye-opener for the organization. Because sometimes, for my current co-op students, I like to challenge them. I like to provide them more work than they're able to get done because I want to see what they'll do in those stressed moments. I want them to rise to the occasion. And so don't think about those, those challenges as a negative. Think about it as a positive. What am I learning out of this? So I'll, I'll share with you my co-op experience. I had a unique co-op experience. It was fantastic to begin with, and it was horrible at the end. I went in, and I got to do everything human resource related, and it was fantastic. Halfway through, my supervisor changed, and their perception of what a co-op is changed. And so I got to do filing. I got to do paper shredding for the last two months of my co-op. Yay. But what, I, what did I learn out of that? I learned that... I wanted to be able to be in a position that I could give back to the university, to give back to the co-op students, to ensure that if I ever had the opportunity to have co-ops, that I would make sure that I would provide them with any opportunity that I could to learn and grow. So what was a negative experience actually became a positive and propelled me forward. And that's really what you need to do when you're in your co-ops or in life, is figure out those, those negative moments and see how you can actually grow positively from it. Any questions before I move on to the next slide? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I have a good question about maintaining the learning attitude. Are there resources? Because sometimes uh, I kind of see learning attitude as a mess or morale or, uh, or uh, 
self-motivation. If that becomes a problem, what kind of resources would be available? That's all. Um, it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on the organization that you're part of. Um, not this current organization, but organizations in the past that I've been a part of. There's been resources on site that students were able to utilize. Um, not at the moment, uh, for my current organization. But when you get to those moments, that's when you reach out to the co-op office, um, and they can give you strategies. And um, on behalf of the co-op office. We are connected on campus with resources that you as a student can draw to work for and we still link them as a student. So we have not only the team, any of us would love to speak with you but at, on the phone, in person, with the students that drive, how do you know that drop by because they, they'd like to speak in person. But there are accounting and support services, there's other resources and, and we would want to know. We would be sad and disappointed if we had heard at the end that you had some issues or what just wanted to talk to someone. And you did reach out. So that's one of the main things we want students to remember. We're, we're here. We just need you not to know that they'll have ESP. We need you to, to tell us and, and use our resources. Thank you. All right. One more slide. And there's this question. So the last time I had the opportunity and pleasure to speak here was all about brand. And so this is brand breakers. These are behaviors. Um, that you can do in an organization which will damage you um, either in the moment or professionally for years, um, depending on where you're at in your career. Lack of courtesy. Common, you know, golden rule. You want to do others that you would like and have done on you, right? Uh, seems, seems really, like, why is he even mentioning it? I have to mention it because it happens. Um, and it's important to be cognizant of that to be respectful and courteous at all times. Absence of authenticity. So um, a couple years ago, I terminated someone. Um, they weren't working out, so I let them go. But I let them, I said to them, I said, you know what? Um, it just wasn't a good fit. If you'd like, you can use me as a reference move. Um, and I'll try to help you get to that next uh, position. So then I look on my LinkedIn account. And I see that um, they have, they weren't authentic on what they were portraying who they were when they were part of my organization. So how do you think that reference went for them? Not good. Um, if they were authentic, even on the point of termination, I would have provided them a great reference. They weren't right for my organization, but they had a lot of really great skill sets. But because they chose to be um, disingenuous about what they were representing about their brand, I wasn't going to support that. So again, the absence of authenticity, um, you know, that, that interview, uh, you have your elevator pitch, you've got that, that moment to shine, and you're, you know, you're saying, oh, I can do all these things, but come day one, you can't do any of them? You're probably not going to be around a whole lot. And I'm probably not going to give you a lot of really awesome opportunities and projects within your co-op. Lack of initiative. This is one thing I hate. I hate having to be like, okay, this is what I want you to do today. Here's the list. I hate it. I love it when students or employees come to me and say, hey, Pat, uh, what do you want me to get done today? How can I help you today? At the end of the day, Pat, I'm just, I'm all done my work for today. Is there anything I can help you with before you leave? Right? That, that resonates huge with the employer. Uh, this goes without saying, quantity over quality. Give me your best work. I understand that you as students going into your co-ops aren't going to be at the same level that someone in my organization five, ten years will be. I understand that. But the work that I that I see you do better be quality. <laughs> um, covering up mistakes. Yep, I've seen it. Don't do it. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. This is what cults are about. It's about learning, growing. Um, and through those mistakes that we learn, we learn valuable lessons. 
Um, if you try to hide it, that affects your brand. That affects you, your credibility, moving forward. Um, dismissing others' input uh, in a group setting, you talk over somebody else, you don't allow someone else the opportunity to speak. You're dismissive of their concepts or ideals, don't do it. Um, time theft and office shenanigans. Um, it seems strange. A couple years ago, I worked in an organization where um, they would, uh, uh, these shenanigans were going back and forth where um, they would escalate. I'm going to do this to you. They did this to them. And it kept going to the point where um, the file cabinet beside them, they pulled it out, they lined it with a liner, filled it with water, and put goldfish in it. Close the drawer. And this is where, when I got involved as HR, because something that, that seems fun um, has now escalated this point, because besides this file cabinet was our server for a call center that serviced um, 10,000 calls a day. So um, you've got occupational health and safety um, and tons of other things potentially that are there. So then I had to insert myself and deal with that situation. Did I think it was funny? Yeah. And I would have laughed if it was somebody else's organization, but it wasn't. So it's okay to have fun and engage, but think about that. When time stepped, it took them two hours to empty the drawer and find a place for these fish to go. That's time I'm paying for. I'm not paying someone to come in and clean fish. I'm paying them to work. That's what I want. Um, and so the same thing, sometimes you'll, you'll go talk to your supervisor and you'll be outside the door and you notice that they're on the phone and you've got that, that hover. I'm just going to hover by the door. Or I see that they're on the phone, but there's a, this awesome chair right beside it. And I have a question for my supervisor. I'm just going to sit here. Uh, that's so annoying. Um, going back to that initiative, if I'm busy as the employer, go find something else that's productive that will occupy the time until I'm available, and then come back to me. Or find out if um, the methods of communication are there. I'm on the phone, but I'm still checking my email. You could just send me a quick email if it's something critical. So it's making sure that you're using your time wisely. Because what I look at that, I'm like, they waited outside my office for like 15 minutes. They could have been doing so many other things. What the heck? Um, and that becomes an annoyance for me. And again, that reflects your brand. Does that make sense for everyone? So, oh, gossip. Yes. Um, in every organization that I have been a part of, gossip has been a critical problem in it. It is in every organization. You will experience it. Um, don't be part of it. Um, it destroys morale, it destroys your reputation, um, and it's really not fun having to sit with me on the other side of the desk from the HR perspective that I bring. It's not good, you don't want to go there. Um, if you have a problem with a coworker, as we mentioned before, we talked about talking to the person, straight out of the horse's mouth, talking to the supervisor, talking to the co-op office, but never, 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 never uh, bad mouth a coworker, or an offhanded remark about a situation at the office. It will damage you. Questions? Which is the next slide. Questions? Yeah. Um, in organizations where the hierarchy may not be as black and white as you described now, so uh, you may have like multiple superiors, um, unfortunately, what? When you spoke a lot about how like your brand is important and what your um, your expectations of you are very important, when you have different expectations of you from different kind of chains of command, um, that sometimes is maybe contradictory. What would you suggest is a good strategy? For that? Uh, it's a great question. Um, for those, I don't know if the Calgary people could hear that, um, but the question was asked: What happens if you have multiple? Um, supervisors or people that can influence decision and or your work. Um, 
and how do you balance that in excess, right? So um, I have been part of organizations that, that have had that structure. It is horrible. It's unpleasant. And what's really um, important from day one is you're going to go through an orientation process. You're going to be set up with someone initially that's going to answer your questions. And asking them that question and say, you know what, I've noticed that I'm going to have, or you might ask, how many people might I be reporting to? Or how many people might have influence on my work? Um, and what might be the best situation if presented with the case, the scenario that you gave? Because the organization will recognize that. And they'll, they might say, you know what, if the CEO asks something, they get stopped billing. Uh, you just do it. Um, but then they also might um, look to you and say, we want you to prioritize and triage um, the workload that's being presented. Um, and that really goes back to communicating on your part to the different parties saying, um, I understand that you want this project done. However, I'm also working on this one, and their deadline is this. May I extend to here? Um, so you're still communicating effectively about what the challenge is, challenge is or are, um, and asking for guidance or you know extension or whatnot. But really, the biggest thing is the communication about um, identifying to one party, four parties, five parties. In the organization I was part of, there was ten, ten different people that all of us saw a component of my work, um, and it was really challenging trying to navigate and ensure that all different areas, because they all had the expectation that their work was the most important work to get done. Um, and so having that communication right from the beginning will build you for success. Any other questions? Yeah. What if your organization is small because you want students to be on small businesses? And, um, really important to know there's value in the startup, you know, lower than parents' office environment. What you do if there isn't a lot of structure or orientation? The employer may not have a tax system with HR department. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Uh, this is the balance that you need to have, is um, lots of uh, small organizations might not have university degrees. They might not have your experience and background coming into it. And so having an open, honest, authentic dialogue respectfully with that organization um, about the skill set that you bring to the table and that they may be able to leverage that they haven't even thought about. How can you, and this is what I always recommend for both my students and for myself, in any organization that you're a part of, how are you leading the organization better at the end of it? How has the organization changed? What mark have you left on that organization? Um, and in a smaller organization, it's a lot easier to provide that mark if they're allowing you to do so. But it, it's that balance about bringing what you have and bringing it into, um, I guess, the professional realm, taking the theory to practice. Because it doesn't always work all the time. And there has to be um, outside-the-box thinking and engagement to make it happen. Anyone else? Anyone from Calgary have any questions? Okay, well, um, just in uh, wrap up then, um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. How, how was it? Was it good? You learned something? Thumbs up? Yes? Okay, I like the clap. Sure. Go ahead.